Hi, I'm Wayne Jones. Welcome to Editing Writing. This is Episode 7, Editing and Not Editing, A Writer's Style. I wanted to start by talking about uh, just saying three brief anecdotes about regarding style from three very, very different uh, artists. Uh, The first one is one that I've talked about before on a previous episode in this podcast, uh, the writer Vladimir Nabokov. And uh, he was doing an interview and in, in apologizing for his editing of the transcript of the interview, Uh, He said in a letter to Robert Hughes, who was an interviewer for National Educational Television, here's the quote from Nabokov. I am terribly sorry if my extensive cuts are causing you any disappointment, but I am sure you will understand that after all, I am almost exclusively a writer and my style is all I have. So that's one short anecdote. The other one is about uh, another writer I know well, uh, Samuel Johnson. This is, I'm writing, actually writing a biography of him. He's a writer who lived in the 18th century in England, mostly in London, but was born in a small town called Litchfield. And he's very famous for his, what's often called his dense writing style, at least in some of his pieces. And part of my research, I mean, I'm doing research for this book, obviously, and I've got three or four full-on books, monographs, that are about his style alone. So that'll give you an idea, perhaps, of, of how distinctive it was, how important it was, how much a marker it was in, in how he's perceived as a writer. And the other story, I, re- I remember this story uh, from years and years ago, and it's quite different from the other two, but uh, depending on how old you are, you may or may not remember this, but back in 1985, a bunch of Canadian singers got together to produce uh, a song called Tears Are Not Enough. It was a basically a charity aid song for the, there was a famine going on in Ethiopia there then and uh, the idea was to make the song while these famous singers and uh, you know sell it and the money would go for the for famine relief in Ethiopia so a good cause the producer was David Foster Wallace and at one point or so the story goes anyway he uh, he found one of Neil Young's words were flat and he asked him to re-record it (laughs) And young Neil Young's now famous response was, "That's my sound, man." <laughs> I, I I always like that story because, you know, as far as a, as far as a singer goes, as far as a musician goes, your sound is your style. I mean, that, you know, it's the uh, the point he was making. I don't want to be explaining the joke too much here, but is that you know. Uh, there's nothing wrong with what I did. That's that's what I do. <laughs> that's who I am. So, uh, in passing, though, the the importance, the thing I wanted to say here about this about style, because you know, you one might be might might have a tendency to dismiss style as something, you know, maybe perhaps not all that important. You know, maybe. What's the book about? You know, what's the message of the book? Uh, people might, some people might think, uh, and and other things like that. But these things really show the importance of style. I mean, I'm really mo- mostly struck by the uh, by Nabokov saying, "My style is all I have." That I, for me, that's an amazing statement to make about uh, about writing about a writer. You know, that's what you have. Uh, it, it reminded me, uh, you know, that the reason that's right is because, you know, for example, if you took uh, any of any of the, the, the pieces by any of those three people I just mentioned, Abakoff, Johnson, and uh, Neil Young, and you just say you took took it and just summarized it in very plain kind of technical writing prose, what they write or sing, 
it obviously would not be the same thing. So there's a, you know, the admixture of style. It's not not as if it's put together like a cake recipe or anything, but, you know, that's what makes it what it is. It's not, you can't summarize it and, and consider it to be the same thing as a whole different uh, beast uh, in that way. Uh, it used to reminds me of the old uh, statement, you know. Uh, they used to, say, I'm not sure if it's correct to say this anymore. Uh, the clothes make the man, uh, and in French, I, rem I remember this from studying French. It's la bifé le moine, which means the habit makes the monk. And both of those statements are probably uh, politically incorrect and very unwoke to say now. But anyway, it reminds me about that, you know, about there's something, it's the, it's the adding of something or it's something from the person that makes the person what the person is or makes the work of the person what the work of the, the person is. So it, when I talk about style, I'm mostly talking about fiction, but other works too, other artistic works involving words, it also applies there as well. Applies to nonfiction, you know, for writers who have a, a distinctive way. There was uh, a few years ago a really excellent uh, biography of the essayist from the uh, 16th century, I suppose, Montaigne. Uh, his, his book was called Essay, you know, in French, uh, Essays, published in 1580. Uh, so that would be, you know, sort of around Shakespearean times. And um, a, a woman named Sarah Bakewell wrote a biography of Montaigne called How to Live or A Life of Montaigne in One Question and 20 Attempts at an Answer. So this, for me, you know, even the title is an indication of that this is not going to be a standard biography and it's not i've read it it is quite excellent and you know it's not as if it indicates that she's you know it's totally wacko and she's not uh, uh you know uh, doing research and not really interested or interested in you know uh, uh accurately portraying the life of montagna but it shows that she's approaching it in a very different way with a different style you know, it's arranged uh, kind of thematically or by question. And then uh, in answering those questions, she will, uh, uh, the end result will be that uh, she will she will have answered, she will have produced a biography of, of Montaigne. It's really, really good, really, really excellent way to approach it. And also, you know, it gives it really uh, a, um, a level of interest that you might not have if you just sort of started from, you know, Montaigne was born in blah, 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 and died in blah, 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 by the time you get to page 300. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not dismissing all biography like that as being, you know, pathetic or anything like that, but uh, this obviously is trying to do something very, very different. So, and of course, the title is there, How to Live. And that may tell you something about um, what her thoughts are on what Montaigne's life was all about, what he was trying to do in his writing. And the other example is very different, and this is this is a, this is one that uh, if there's one other listener out, if there's one listener out there who knows this reference, <laughs> I'll send you a hundred dollars. Just send me an email. Uh, <laughs> Uh, first one to send hundred dollars, just in case uh, you know there are too many. Uh, but um, he's a he's a Canadian literary critic now dead. Uh, Northrop Frye is his name, and he wrote this excellent, groundbreaking work back in 1957 called Anatomy of Criticism, and this is where he basically. Criticism in this sense, meaning literary criticism, meaning, you know, basically scholarly consideration of, of works of literature. And uh, this anatomy of criticism, really, I've always been just kind of super impressed by it, not only for the content, but because it basically turned, as I see it anyway, 
And I'm not sure what's happened since the 50s, not because uh, I haven't followed it in detail, but it basically turned uh, literary criticism around. It really did it very, very differently. And But the writing of it, you would expect this is a pretty esoteric topic. This is also a very uh, broad thing is that in that he's not... Uh, analyzing just a sort of a slice of literature or Canadian literature. He's talking about all of literature, everything. And uh, But it's an excellent example of highly intelligent writing on a groundbreaking a topic, uh, a narrow topic in a sense. I mean, it's about uh, literary criticism. But he's looking at, as I say, looking at everything, but the thing that always impressed me about it was that the writing is extremely clear and also his his very uh, sharp wit and his very great sense of humor comes through in it as well. It's a really excellent book. And also to do this in, you know, the book is probably not more than, I don't know, 225 pages or something like that. Uh, just a really excellent piece of work, which I actually reread every few years because it just reminds me uh, of uh, I, I just it just exudes intelligence, humor, uh, just and you just have to admire the mind. I just I just completely amazed that at that. So. Um, so my point here about the the biography and about the um, uh, Northrop Fry and literary criticism is that there are styles involved in those things too. This is not uh, the, the just because you're writing on a certain a topic that might be considered uh, dry or uninteresting to other people doesn't mean that the writer doesn't have a style about it. So style is something that the editor has to be conscious of, not just for these examples. You know, the, you know writers, uh, published writers, but for any clients who send their novels to a, to a to an editor as well to be edited. You know, uh, all writing can probably use a little editing, but it's very important that the editor not only recognize the style, but respect it as well and not be asking the writer to change it. So uh, th that's very important. You can't sort of approach, an editor cannot approach all writing uh, with the same sort of mindset. Um, uh, and that, that's, that's super important. Uh, and just to get back to, to some more sort of examples of what I talk about when I talk about style, uh, there can be many aspects of style. And taking, again, going back to novels as an example, or fiction at least, um, you know, a style can be uh, typographical. Uh, for example, a couple of, uh, just a couple of examples here, you know, typically when we indicate dialogue in a, uh, in a novel or in almost all works that you see, at least in, in North America, it's double quotation marks. And some people are so used to this now in novels, you know, if you see dialogue happening, you see double quotes, said Sally, that sort of thing. Uh, not all writers do it that way. And it, you know, for some of them, it becomes a very distinctive mark of their style. The great writer Cormac McCarthy, um, uh, on uh, you know, uh, the great movie, the great film by the Coen brothers called No Country for Old Men, was based on his his uh, novel. He doesn't use anything for for dialogue, so it'll just be, you know, uh, uh, that's a great piece of pie, comma said Sally, and that's a great piece of pie, won't be in uh, quote marks or anything. There'd be no indication that it's dialogue. And the idea is, I mean, it fits actually very well with his uh, other aspects of his style because there's a very much a kind of a minimal or simplest, sim simple um, uh, feeling from his writing. And to have it sort of cluttered up, so to speak, with um, with quotation marks just might look a little odd, frankly. And it's very, very much suits 
uh, his his style, and obviously his publishers have agreed to to go along with him in that. And actually, a friend of mine who's published fiction, uh, books of short stories, uh, has a has a style that's uh, typographical as well. His name is Oscar Martins, and he's uh, he's uh, his latest book of short stories is called No Call Too Small, and uh, he uses what are called what editors call M dashes in order to indicate dialogue, and these are they're basically sort of three kinds of what you might call dashes, although the first one's not really a dash, but there's the hyphen, you know, the little one between that you see between words. Then there's a sort of a shorter one that's used in very specific circumstances or sometimes can substitute. And then there's the, the long dash. You, you probably are very familiar with seeing that. You know, instead of a colon sometimes, you'll see this long dash that's about, I don't know, it's a little bit, probably half a centimeter long or something like that. Uh, and that's what he uses to to uh, to indicate dialogue. And he's he's again, you know, uh, managed to convince his publishers that this is an important part of his style, and he would he would like the the dialogue to be done like that. And uh, um, so my point here is that there's this is. Style as a general sort of concept can manifest itself in di very, very different ways. Some very obvious on the page, like this sort of thing about uh, typography, but uh, other ones are more, and I'm going to talk about some of these other ones, but other ones are more uh, having to do with the uh, subject matter or, or the uh, dialogue or other aspects. For example, uh, there sometimes can be distinctive spellings that a writer uses, and sometimes the reason for doing that is that they're trying to render some kind of dialect or the way someone speaks uh, differently. Uh, so they will use words that you know are not sort of the standard word or are not the standard way that we abbreviate, abbreviate a word. You know, if the narrator or the characters universally say don't pronounce the full ing, I-N-G, at the end of a word, uh, you know, typically what one does, and if one were being the by-the-book editor, you would put, uh, uh, you know, an apostrophe after the I-N to indicate that the G is not there. And But some writers, you know, especially if this indication of they really want to demonstrate that their characters are talking this way. And so you would have that right through the book, these G's being missing from the ING. Uh, perhaps you don't want the book cluttered with a bunch of apostrophes. So you would just have, um, I don't know why I'm thinking of this word, but like fucking, for example, uh, instead of having F-U-C-K-I-N apostrophe, which is the common way that one indicates that a letter is missing in a word, you'd have no apostrophe, F-U-C-K-I-N, and just leave it at that. And again, that's uh, that can be a stylistic aspect as well. And uh, that's something that, uh, you know, for example, if you were the editor, before you went ahead, if you had a manuscript like that from a client and you saw that they were all like that, uh, you might correct the first one. But if you kept seeing that they were if they were constantly done like that, you should query the the client. You should query the writer then and ask if, well, that's intentional and if they would like to leave them like that and go back and fix the ones that you've changed because or have a conversation about uh, it could be you know that the it's accidental on the part of the writer or they don't know or whatever it might be. But it's it's definitely worthy of a conversation. It's definitely not a good idea to just simply go well, you know, to, to make the the very simplistic uh, conclusion. Oh, this is this is incorrect in court according to style guide on page whatever. Um, it's better to uh, check with the writer for sure. Other sorts of style are, I mean, in just broad terms, uh, you know what I would call like expansiveness or minimalism. Those are two, the sort of the two extremes. And 
if you've done any reading of uh, fiction, for example, you'll know what I mean here. There are certain uh, books that are very um, expansive doesn't mean uh, wordy necessarily. It just means that, uh, let's say, a lot of things are described or the writer takes a lot of time to go into the details of settings and clothing and things like that. Uh, hopefully because they think that it's important and not just to sort of fill out the pages. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a, not something that I personally really like a lot. Although as an editor, if I were editing that sort of thing, it's not as, it wouldn't be my job to convince the writer to listen, you've got to cut it down. So that it's like at, you know, Raymond Carver or Cormac McCarthy level, you know, you've got to really make it super minimal. That That is not, that is uh, definitely not what you do. Uh, uh, and minimalism is another way that you see writers uh, writing as well. And these are writers who uh, really cut it down to the spare level and uh, who don't consider things like uh, necessarily setting or the details of a setting or the details of what it looked like in the bar or what clothing the person was wearing, who don't consider those to be important aspects. You know, they've, they really try to pare it down to, uh, to what the basics are and what they think uh, is important. So um, another very obvious uh, aspect of style, I often referred to, you know, abbreviations, but the choice of language, words, and the vocabulary generally is something that's very much sort of what style is built on. And uh, I already mentioned also uh, Samuel Johnson and his his really dense diction. Um, uh, basically, uh, it applies to a lot of his writing, but if, if you really want to see what it's like, he wrote a series of essays between 1750 and 1752 called The Rambler. And that's often what people are talking about when they talk about his dense writing style. Uh, very, you know, not something you can just sort of uh, be on the beach and sort of just, just blithely go through when you're reading. Uh, and I'm not saying, you know, the writing is excellent, as you would expect from someone who <laughs> who wrote his own dictionary. But uh, the, uh, the the it's not something to be to 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 be read breezily, uh, that that's for sure. And I would contrast that with uh, this is another one of my favorite books uh, that's in a very very different style. Uh, this is fiction, and uh, whereas the Rambler was is nonfiction, uh, The Catcher in the Rye by J D Salinger. And it has the, if you don't know it, you really, it's really a book to read. Um, it might feel different now because back in the day, it was very uh, groundbreaking. And I still consider it so and still love the book a lot. And uh, I haven't read it for a while, but uh, it's worthy of it. And it has a very famous opening paragraph. And it will this opening paragraph. I'm just I'm just going to read part of it because actually the opening paragraph is quite long, but uh, it'll give you an indication not only of style in the sense of Salinger's writing, but also what this character is like just from what he's saying because it's written from the first person point of view, and this is a this is a teenager teenage boy who's uh, who's right who's uh, speaking, so. Uh, here's 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 the first part of the of the opening paragraph. Quote: If you really want to hear about it, the first thing you'll probably want to know is where I was born and what my lousy childhood was like and how my parents were occupied uh, and all before they had me and all that David Copperfield kind of crap. But I don't feel like going into it. If you want to know the truth, in the first place, that stuff bores me. And in the second place, my parents would have about two hemorrhages apiece if I told anything pretty personal about them. They're quite touchy about anything like that, especially my father. They're nice and all, I'm not saying that, but they're also touchy as hell. Besides, I'm not going to tell you my whole goddamn autobiography or anything. Unquote. <laughs> 
So that gives, I mean, I, that's just superior writing there. You know, you can, you, uh, uh, wow, you tell a lot from what, what that character is going to be like uh, just from reading that little bit there. So, and other writers write like that. You know, uh, perhaps not as well. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty high bar that Salinger set, uh, sets. But this kind of conversational style, and you'll often see it in the, in the uh, in when they're writing in the first person, the first person, the I, and especially if the depending on the character, you'll often see this sort of conversational style where it feels, you know, for example, that read, that writing feels really loose in a way, but. Uh, who knows what how much time the writer took to make it feel that way it's not as if just because it's uh feels loose and breezy and easy and stuff like that that uh that uh, a lot of work didn't go into it so uh excellent anyway read catcher in the rye you'll you'll really like it so just getting back to what the editor does. So you, you have this thing called style and, you know, what does the editor do with all that? How is the editor supposed to react with, to, and work with that? Uh, I mean, the editor is there to serve the writer and the reader. Uh, there's certainly lots of things that are not really style related that the editor needs to keep attentive to. You know, these are things like, uh, you know, the... Uh, uh, correcting typographical errors and uh, querying the author about the use of a word or if a passage they can't understand or something like that. So there's there's lots of that that an ed editor does. And even regarding style, it's important for the editor to point out things that they, the editor, feel uh, are, are is not really working. You know, the, the editor is generally a highly experienced reader you know they've had you know if an editor has been working for 10 or 15 years a freelance editor say who has has, read, has probably read more novels than most people have and they have experience with things so um you know their their judgment or their assessment is is worth listening to often uh is worth is often worth listening to uh and uh, a lot of editing, though, uh, and a good editor will know this, a lot of editing can involve not boldly, quote-unquote, correcting the author, but querying the author. So, you know, typically, just mechanically, what happens is that if you correct the author, you do that in the text of a Word document, and if you query the author, you might send them an email, but if you're just doing it in the, in the manuscript itself, uh, you do it in in marginal comments, and you know the the advantage there is that it provides a kind of a context. You'll highlight whatever you, the editor will highlight whatever they are are puzzled about. Uh, they ex will explain their hesitation or their pause or their confusion about that sentence or that paragraph or whatever it might be, and uh, it could turn out sometimes that it's something that the writer never noticed or didn't consider and a uh, conversation can result and a change might end up being ever uh, being the result of it as well so it's important I, I know when I do editing I always want to uh, understand like I need to be able to read it and understand what's going on and uh, I will query if I don't uh, if there's a, even a single sentence where I, I just I don't see what is being said here. Uh, I, I don't understand it. Uh, you're doing the the reader the, the yes the reader ultimately, but you're doing certainly doing the writer a favor by querying on that because it may be very a very simple thing. It may be that it's you the editor you missed something, uh, but it may be that the writer just you know. Uh, just didn't successfully bring across what they were trying to get at, and so you will have done a done done the the editor, the writer a good favor. Its style is not something that has this scream out at the editor and reader, but the absence of a, a kind of a style, if they can put it that way, it's hard to say. It's 
one of those things like, you know, the absence of a personality. Uh, everyone has a personality, so it's, it's sort of a incorrect to say there's an absence. But uh, let's just go with that for now and say the absence of any kind of style in, for me anyway, in my experience, and I'm getting a little bit away from editing now, but uh, can make a novel tedious, boring, and just downright bad. And, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's something that uh, an editor, for example, needs to consider differently. By, by which I mean, even though uh, the book might have an absence of style, we'll call it for now, and the, the editor may not enjoy what they're reading, uh, it, there's, they're still able to professionally edit the book, that's for sure. You should be able to do that. Uh, or you can, perhaps if you're not interested as an editor in going through books like that, you uh, turn those down. You don't have to take on anything. You're not uh, sort of forced to. But, you know, if the writing is tepid, if the storyline is very safely chronological, if the characters are bland or stereotypes, if the story starts in a very sort of mashed potato-y kind of way and ends that way, and there's a lot of mashed potato in the middle as well, and if nothing really sings about the writing, about the style, then there's likely not much of a novel there. Um, you know, uh, so there is that. I mean, um, I, I mean, this is a very broad statement, and I realize that different styles appeal to different people, but uh, just because a style is appreciated and liked by large sectors of the the reading population, readers, it doesn't mean that, and I think this is a truism, that this won't be news to anyone, it doesn't mean that everyone likes it. I mean, uh, I don't happen to like Charles Dickens or Margaret Atwood's writing or the Beatles, but a large number of people seem to. Uh, you know, they don't lack style. They just have one that I don't enjoy very much. <laughs> so, but as I say, an editor has to be objective. They have to recognize style where it is. And as, of course, uh, just to maybe say it more accurately, even an absence of style is a style, just like, you know, with life decisions, even if you don't make a decision, that is a decision in itself. So... Uh, but a writer needs to be objective, and uh, you can still work on a book uh, that has a lot of mashed potato in it. So, so in, in closing, what it means for the editor is that they just can't come to every work they edit with the same mindset. That's the very important part. It's not as if uh, these are not widgets that are, you know, that you're that you're uh, being sent. These are all very, very unique. Uh, objects uh, of art that you're that you're working on, or nonfiction, which can be art as well. Uh, so you have to bring a, a different a different mindset in a way. I, I don't mean that your standards are different or that how you go about it might be different as an editor, but you have to recognize that uh, there will be some things in this book that in the previous book would have been uh, quote unquote wrong. The writer wouldn't have wanted that way and you would have quite rightly corrected it. So uh, you, you, you have to bring a different, uh, you, ha you have to wear a different uh, habit, <laughs> a different set of clothing for each book that you're, uh, that, you're, that you're editing. And you have to really be attentive to the really broad strokes of what the uh, author is trying to do. And that's all for this episode. Uh, thank you again so, so much for listening. Uh, if you have any comments of any kind, if you have any suggestions, questions, 
complaints, uh, suggestions for things I might cover in a, in a future episode, uh, please go to my website at waynejones.ca and follow the links there and you'll get to this uh, podcast and you'll find a place where you can, on that site, where you can contact me by phone, by text, by email, uh, in a number of ways, even by online form. So uh, again, thanks very much for listening and uh, we'll uh, talk again soon.